Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's Lunch with Haley. I'll be one of your hosts. My name is Brad Smith. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer here at Haley Marketing Group. Uh, while we're waiting for everybody to get in, we just opened up the waiting room. Everybody's piling in now. If you don't mind, use the chat or use the uh, Q&A panel to just let us know where you're dialing in from. I see Jane's dialing in from Baltimore. Myself, I am located just outside of Buffalo, New York, where we are headquartered. I know Jeff, our chief marketing officer, who is going to be joining us, is coming from Cleveland. We got Terrence from Atlanta, Deborah from Raleigh, uh, Jacqueline from Mass, Grand Rapids in the house, Troy, Michigan, Maryland. Love it. Anybody on the West Coast joining us today? We've got Midwest and we've got the Northeast. How about uh, anyone from the South or West? Kayla from Boston. Go Sox. Oh, we've got Oregon in the house. Jonathan, welcome. We've got Nicole from sunny California and Julie from San Diego. Julie, I would trade spots with you in a heartbeat. I love San Diego. All right, terrific. My next question for you is, what are you seeing in the market right now? Are you seeing some slowdown in sales? Are you seeing some of your biggest clients begin to scale back hiring? Uh, are you full steam ahead and seeing some growth? Are you still dealing with candidate shortages? Talk to me a little bit about what you're seeing in the market, and then we'll try to tailor some of our content to what is happening for you. Oh, Jacqueline says yes to all of the above. Michelle, thank you for joining us. Great to talk to you again. Terrence is still dealing with candidate shortages. I know a bunch of us are. Candidate shortage, but full steam ahead in hiring. That's great. Rebound from the headwinds earlier this year. I'm happy to hear that. Jean says there's longer decision making and salary expectations from candidates have gone sky high. Jean, you're not alone. We'll, we're going to touch on those longer decision making uh, issues in today's presentation, hopefully give you some solutions or some tactics you can use to help get around that. And also hopefully make that hiring decision ultimately end in your favor. Um, healthcare slowdown over the last six weeks, longer decision-making. Yep. I've heard that too. Excellent. All right. Um, thank you for setting the stage, everyone. Really appreciate that engagement and interaction. Throughout today's presentation, keep it up. If there's something specific that you want to cover, something that you want to dig into, we'll do our best to cover those. And if not, we're also available afterwards. We're going to leave some time for Q&A at the end, and we're going to jump in. And today's Lunch with Haley is all about leveling up and more specifically, how we can nurture, how we can stay top of mind and ahead of the pack. And this ties directly into the issue that many of you are noting. There is a longer decision-making process right now. There's a whole host of reasons, okay? Part of it is that no longer is staffing a one-person decision, okay? In the past, several years ago, you may have been dealing with the hiring manager, who made the ultimate decision. Well, now they have to talk to procurement. They have to talk to HR. They might have to talk to the CFO. They might have to talk to the accounting manager. They might have to talk to risk. They're going to have to talk to legal. There's so many issues right now with changing a vendor. And so many people are in the buying process now. So instead of a, a one person deal, you have to sell value to five different people in some cases. And you have to change the value proposition a little bit so that it appeals to each one of those different audiences. So we're going to talk about how to do that and share some, some specific examples. So let's dig in. And I mentioned Jeff, our chief marketing officer. He's going to be joining us in a little bit. He's having some Apple technical difficulties, but he is uh, working on that and dialing in right now. So let's kick things off. Uh, as you saw in the chat, as we were talking about challenges, 2023 is off to a interesting start, challenging start. It's keeping us busy, that's for sure. And what we're finding is that unemployment 
really hasn't improved too much for us from a recruiting standpoint, still super low unemployment. We still have this candidate shortage. That's for a number of reasons. We're seeing boomers retire. Okay? We are seeing less participation in the workforce. We're seeing lower overall population and birth figures. We're seeing less immigration. There's so many issues at play here. Unemployment is low, and unfortunately, it's probably not going to get much better for the foreseeable future. The, the data and the analytics don't point to recruiting becoming any easier. So for those employers out there that are holding out, that are hoping there's going to be this influx of candidates, we have to tell that message that, you know what, I'm sorry, unfortunately, there isn't. So we need to make sure that uh, as we're having these discussions, we outline and clearly convey that to them that uh, we're not in, we're not going to overcome this talent shortage anytime soon. So you need to be aggressive with your hiring. You need to align yourself with the right staffing partners and staffing providers that are going to help you source and find that talent proactively. We do have more jobs being added, uh, but I will say I'm hearing in the market that there's beginning to be a little bit of a slowdown. We saw in ASA's latest staffing index that staffing sales have declined just a little bit, not much, not, you know, nothing to be overly concerned about, uh, but uh, we need, need to be aware. And we need to also be aware that we might have to sell and market a little bit more aggressively over the coming year than we had in the past. And that kind of brings us to this slide that as we approach the rest of 2023, as we enter 2024, we can't expect the same thing that we've seen over the last few years. I'll be blunt, the last few years, selling wasn't hard. In fact, we really didn't even have to sell. Orders came to us because end employers couldn't hire and they used us out of necessity. Uh, we're going to have to get back to selling. We're going to have to get back to those outbound activities. We're going to have to get back to aggressively marketing so that we can drive more traffic and increase our inbound orders. But we need to take one strategy at a time. Leveling up is going to take time. Okay, uh, If you go in and you try to do every single thing that we're going to cover in today's webinar, you might do some of it good might do some of it okay and some of it not great. Let's pick one or two strategies that we can really get behind, that we can really do amazing at, and let's focus on those and drive results for our organizations. So let's dig in a little bit. Leveling up nurturing really starts with what makes you unique. And I want to talk about positioning and how you develop a strong positioning message for your company. I want you to ask yourself this question in your head. What truly makes us different? What truly makes us unique? You can do it in your head. You can write it on a piece of paper. After you do that, though, I want you to ask yourself a follow-up question. Is that the same thing that my competitor is saying? What I run into so many times is when I ask a uh, staffing leader, what makes you unique, I get, we provide better service. We have more access to talent. We have better people. We do a better job of screening. We have tenured staff that provides better service or some variation of that message. The challenge here is that if your competitors up and down the street are saying the same damn thing, it doesn't matter. It's diluted. It doesn't mean anything. And to illustrate this point, I was I was recently speaking at a conference in Chicago, and um, it was great. It was it was in person. Leading into that conference, I just went to the internet and I looked up staffing agencies in Chicago, and I said, "All right, I'm going to grab three random staffing agencies. I'm going to look at their websites. I'm going to look at how their marketing collateral. I'm going to look at how they are positioned in the market, what they tell the market about their services, um, and let's just see what we can come up with." And I put this these few slides together. So the first example, provider number one. Again, looking at their website, looking at their marketing material, what are they saying is unique about their services? These are direct quotes. Our customized approach is flexible and adaptable. All right, everybody wants flexibility, everyone wants adaptability. 
the personnel we represent are considered part of our company. So we don't just provide temps. We provide people that are part of our organization. They care. We provide each of our clients with a dependable temp service that delivers trained staff and qualified personnel who are dedicated from start to finish. Sounds great, right? We offer a tradition of excellence since 1991, over 30 years, a tradition of excellence. So I said, okay, that sounds great at the surface. Um, doesn't really sound that much different than other staffing companies, but let's go take a look at this particular company's reviews and let's see if these positioning messages are carried through into the market. So what does the market really think about this provider? What does the market think about their customized approach that's flexible and adaptable? Uh, direct quote again, something's wrong with the way they work. Okay, it might be flexible, might be adaptable, but people are people think it's wrong. Personnel we represent are part of our company. Um, I remove names here, but like a competitor, uh, they lie, but they're better at hiding it. They stuff people into small vans for long rides and basically make people fight for work. Shaking my head. Um, doesn't seem like a company I'd want to work for. A tradition of excellence since 91. The review was the worst office I've ever seen in my life. And there were multiple others like this. Okay, let's look at staffing provider number two. Exceptional relationship at building lasting, exceptional reputation at, of building lasting relationships. Seven days a week, their staffing specialists are available. They provide excellent service and response time. So both of those sound great, right? Uh, they build lasting relationships, teams available. What's the market really think about their lasting relationships? This company strings you along, don't waste your time. And that's one way, I guess, to build a lasting relationship is to string people along. Uh, seven days a week, they provide excellent service. The feedback across the board, and this was in multiple, multiple reviews, is that they never pick up the phone. They never answer. Didn't get a call from them until about two to three months later. They don't answer the phone at all. The worst agency in Chicago. All right. Now let's look at provider number three. At this point, I was getting desperate. I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to, uh, hopefully we find somebody that, that's got some good reviews. So provider number three. And I want you to pay attention to how they're positioning these differentiators differently, uniquely than the other two. So provider number three, a world-class candidate NPS score of 82. And then on the site, they went on to explain what that truly means. A 92% offer acceptance rate. Average of 10 days for time to fill. And a 4.8 out of 5 Google rating. So what's the market really think? about their world-class MPS rating. I like the way they meet everyone in person. They understand what I want. They've got an excellent process. They meet, introduce you to a team of recruiters right away, and they all work at finding opportunities. Average of 10 days for time to fill. They move very, very fast, and they planned several steps ahead. And with their Google review rating, helpful and easy to work with from the beginning, they're very considerate and accommodating. I wanted to start this off because the way that they've positioned their company, their organization is very different than the first two. The first two were me, 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 me. What makes me different? What makes me unique? Why should you want to work with me? This company, on the other hand, is focused on, val on the value that they provide to the market. They have a world-class candidate NPS score of 82. They could have said, our candidates are happier, but they didn't. They had data to back it up, and it was about the candidate. It wasn't about them. 92% offer acceptance rate. Average of 10 days to fill. They could say, we provide people quickly. That doesn't mean anything. There's no context behind that. It's not quantitative. Okay. By working with this company, you're going to have somebody in your seat on an average of 10 days or less. And their Google rating, it isn't about them saying how great their organization is. It's about the end service delivery. 
and they had a ton of reviews. So when thinking about what company you would want to work with, I'm not even going to ask the question. I know you'd choose option three. My question for you, though, is when you think about how you're positioned in your market, which one of these buckets do you fall into? Are you number one? Are you number two? Or are you number three? If you're not number three, think about what you can do and what you're really great at so that you can strengthen your positioning message and have a stronger go-to-market messaging and strategy. And I want you and I encourage you to follow Simon Sinek's advice and start with the why. Because people don't buy what you do. Those first two examples that I showed you were all about what you do. Better service. We've got people that are part of the family. Um, we've been delivering excellence for 30 years. Okay. People aren't buying that. They don't buy the what you do. They buy why you do it and the emotional impact it will have on them. So think about the difference that you make for your candidates, the difference that you make for your clients. How can we share that in a compelling way that's quantifiable, that matters to the end buyer? And Brad, and I, one, one thing on there too is, and this is a good one because, um, you know, when, when you take, when you talk about nurturing, you talk about, you know, not just kind of the first touch point, but these continual touch points is take a look at that first email that you send out you know, as a salesperson to, you know, a, either a prospect or maybe it's been an inactive client. And, you know, this, you know, this visual right here is great because most people give you the what, like, Hey, I just want to let you know, this is what we do. If you ever need anything, let me know. But that's not what's, what's going to get somebody to respond. It's the why, Hey, we do this because of this. And, you know, what are you seeing? You know, why are you, you know, and, and those types of, um, you know, emails get a, such a better response rate when you're, getting them to, you know, it's either money or emotion when you're getting them into, into connecting with you. And I always tell people, take a look at that email. If you haven't talked to somebody in a while, nine times out of 10, you're sending like a menu email. Like this is all the stuff that we do. This is what we do. This is how we do it. And this is, and this is, you know, what, if you ever need anything, let me know. And it's just so, oh, I, I, this visual always has me say like, yeah, it's the why. Yeah. And, and you have to understand that if you're sending that menu email. So are five other providers that yep. day. So what are you going to do to really stand out? And whether it's an email, SMS, whether it's a IDM campaign, whatever it is, we need to look at that message and make sure that we have that emotional why in there. Otherwise, you're not going to get a response. Yeah. Um, so to put this into into action, I've, I've got two examples here of, of quick messaging. Um, at Brad's staffing firm, we provide unrivaled service. We match top tier employees with the area's best companies. Our customized solutions provide the level of service you demand. What's wrong with this? N nothing technically. Okay. Um, sounds good. Sounds professional. Nothing's technically wrong with this. Does it evoke an emotional appeal? Hell no. It's the same nonsense that everybody is saying. We provide unrivaled service. We match top tier employees with the area's best companies. Sure, every staffing company is going to say this. Now let's flip this around a little bit. How could we say something similar, but drive more emotional appeal? Well, as Jeff actually just mentioned, we want to evoke that emotional appeal. We want to identify that why. We want to highlight the problem that the end buyer is facing. So let's start with the problem. Unfilled positions, cost companies millions of dollars in lost productivity. With an average time to fill of just 10 days, you'll get the right fit quickly. As a best of staffing award winner in Chicago's highest rated, most reviewed agency, we help you eliminate risk and access top talent quickly. So think about this a little bit. We talked earlier about how the decision-making process is strung out. Part of the reason for that is because there's so many different people that are involved, uh, involved in that buying decision right now. Now, I mentioned earlier, it's the hiring manager, it's procurement, it's the CFO, it's the CEO, it's risk, it's legal, it's all of those different audiences. If you look at this positioning message right here, we address almost every single one of those audiences, okay? We're costing companies millions in lost productivity. You think the CEO and the CFO care about that? Yeah. 
We have an average time to fill of just 10 days. You think the end hiring manager cares about that? Yeah, because they can't do their job or get things done with unfilled positions. Um, do you think procurement cares about a best of staffing award winner in a highest rated and most reviewed agency? Yeah, you think risk cares about that? They sure do. Okay, so we're addressing all of the different buying personas that are involved in that decision-making process. And then we can carry this messaging through to all of the different components that we're using to reach them. So go through, do an audit of your positioning message, do an audit of how your sales reps and your recruiters are using language in their emails, in their outreach, in their phone calls, role play, and see if they are really using your true differentiators consistently. If not, give them strict scripts, give them guidance, give them tips, give them best practices, and make sure everyone in the organization, um, from your sales rep down to service coordinator, down to receptionist, understands exactly the value that you provide, and everyone is speaking that same language. Um, Jeff, I'm going to pass it over to you if you don't mind. Um, talk to us about what other types of value you can include in your positioning message to to really differentiate and, and create that emotional appeal. Yeah, no problem. First, I didn't know you had a staffing firm. So are you How about that? Are you doing all right? Like you yep. guys, you guys killing it? <laughs> yeah, it's it's slowing down a little bit. That's why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So I mean, you know, to Brad's point, and, and this is when you talk about nurture. You to, and, and leveling up your messaging, these are the things putting into those emails, those little check-ins is talking about and just educating them on the value that they are going to receive when they work with you. And it's, again, it's, it's not the what, you know, or the how, which is kind of that, not what you offer. Like, don't give them a menu of what you do. Give them the fact that they can convert fixed expense to variable, lowering their total labor costs. Right now, there's so many unknowns around you know, costs are going up. We don't know if sales are going up. There's all these different just unknowns that are happening. And so you can lower your labor costs. You can reduce turnover training costs. You can move and that, that risk over um, to more of a temporary staffing uh, model. You can, you know, eliminate capacity constraints. All these different pieces, you know, are, are really valuable. And what somebody told me when I was working on the staffing side is, you know, it, it's all about the result of the result. You know, what do they really want to know? They want a faster time to hire. They want core employees to focus on not, not the administrative stuff. They want them to focus on strategy, you know, and you're making sure that deadlines are met because that's an emotional, if we can't hit our deadlines, you know, production or, you know, cost cutting, or we want to get a new product out, you know, we can't, we're missing the boat, we're missing revenue. And it's just about being flexible and being able to, you know, take that pain out of hiring. And then honestly, it's the it, it's lowest risk is you, you're looking at, you know, you have an award, like how Brad staffing company, which, you know, won a bunch of awards, apparently, and you know, he has all these reviews and awards. And so you want to know that you're going to work with a partner that is going to be around, you know, that does it the right way. And, and again, it's about the value they're going to get and that, you know, one plus one equals three, you know, instead of just here's what we do, here's why we do it, blah, 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 blah. Here's how we do it. And nobody really cares. Yeah. And, and most buyers aren't necessarily new to, new to staffing. They most no. have, have used staffing at some point. So when are you coming in? You're coming in when their existing provider screws up or you have something of better value to offer. So being the lowest risk option and being able to back that up and prove that with reviews, with honors, with a strong reputation, uh, eliminates a lot of those barriers and headaches and can help you move forward with that decision-making process quicker. Right. And being the automation nerd that I am, those bullet points can actually be topics of emails if you want to stay mm -hmm. in touch. So using those topics, like I think is, is huge. Yeah, and it's not just uh, enough to say that you do those things. You need proof. So yep. look at case studies, look at data, look at metrics, look at awards, look at honors. What can you do to actually prove that? Or maybe even better yet, what can you do to collect stories from customers or employees to prove it? Because that's so much more powerful than you just saying it. One of the biggest you know, and most successful campaigns that, that I've seen and that we use and we encourage our clients 
is that don't take it from me or don't take it from us. You know, it's that social proof. Here's why we do it. And if you do use those in certain parts of that sales funnel or sales process, it is so powerful because a lot of times it'll take the objective out of the conversation, you know, cause you like the same clients are having the same issue, you know, well, what about this? Can you actually do this? Well, yeah, we just worked with that company and here are the results. So now we're going to transition from talking about messaging. So hopefully you found some value in that. You can think about how to refine your message. Um, now we're going to talk about how to actually incorporate that message into your sales nurturing, into your sales funnel, and make sure that you carry that through start to finish. So we're, we'll talk about sales nurturing and a model that we find very effective. Um, we'll get through that at a high level theory based, and then we're going to hop into very specific tactics that you can do to incorporate that message and drive inbound leads and make your outbound sales tactics more effective. So let's dig in. How do you level up your sales process? You've, if you've been on Lunch with Haley webinars before, you've probably seen this graphic. I'll explain it real quick. This is our funnel. At the top of the funnel, we want to create awareness for our business, awareness for our brand, awareness of the value that we provide and that we offer. Then we want to generate and engage with them and get their interest. And in order to get their interest, we have to clearly explain the problem that they're facing and how we solve it. And that's how we transition from interest to desire. If we can clearly explain how we can help them solve their big pressing need, we're going to be able to get them more interested in working with us and drive action. Now, with action uh, and with marketing specifically, we need to make it simple. Okay, So we could have the best message in the world. We can reach the right people. We can outline and get desire. But if it's not easy to work with us, they're going to go to a different provider. So when I say easy to work with us, look at removing barriers. Make sure that your emails, that your outreach, that your marketing, that your website, that your application is simple and easy to use and leads people down the path you want them to take. Okay, Make it simple for them to reach out to you. Make it simple to complete an application. Make it simple to submit a job order. Remove those roadblocks. All right. Um, so we need to make sure that we're not just selling like everybody else that starts with the message and then it carries through to how we use that message throughout the sales cycle so we've already reviewed the ada model um, now i want to talk to you a little bit about three by three in, in idm so our ada model again is awareness interest desire and then action we want to drive them through that sales funnel but to get closer to our clients, we need to build three by three networks. Said it a bunch of times, you might be sick of hearing it, but there's so many more decision makers in the buying process. We need to expand our network. The person that we're talking with, we need to go one below them. We need to go one above them. We need to go one to the left of them, one to the right of them. So if you're talking to the end uh, hiring manager, probably going to have to talk to the HR manager. You might have to talk um, to the HR analyst. You may have to talk to procurement. You might have to talk to finance. You might have to go all the way up to the CEO and then get referred back down before you close that business. Okay, It's going to differ by account. It's going to differ by company, but look to expand and build those networks. It's also going to safeguard you over time so that when that decision maker, that buyer that you work with leaves the organization, the new person that's coming in isn't just replacing you. You have a strong foundation there. So go three up, three down, three left, three right, build a strong network. And then integrated direct marketing. Jeff, do you want to touch on what IDM is? Yeah, definitely. So, <clears throat> you know, with IDM, you know, what's great about it is it's, it's integrated. And so, when it comes to the sales perspective and what we're trying to do to, to, you know, in this case, nurture is, you know, we want to not just do one email or not just do one channel where we're going to do a couple emails. It's about putting together an entire program that encompasses different touch points. I know, I think we've mentioned it on, on maybe the last lunch with Haley I was on where we were talking about 
uh, sales automation where, you know, it's now up to about 12 to 14 touch points to get somebody to, you know, respond back or elicit a response. And so with integrated direct marketing, you're trying to, to do that. So it's a mixture of uh, direct mail. It's a mixture of email. You're adding in a, you know, a LinkedIn outreach, a call, maybe another call, an email. And that's what we do a lot for our uh, clients right now is put together these integrated direct marketing campaigns because, you know, for me, just doing, you know, one email or two emails without the sales follow-up or any sort of process, it's not going to do anything. But if you can put something together where you're focusing on their, their, their headaches, you know, it's that we talked about it, that emotional, you, you know, it's normally money or, you know, emotion is what's going to elicit a response. If you can say what you want to say and, and give your why in multiple channels or multiple tactics, it's, that is a great way. And then you, you stay in front of them for, you know, maybe 90 days, you know, you're always hitting them with different pieces of this. So integrated direct marketing, I know we've seen, Brad, I'm sure you have too, uh, working directly with clients. Like we've seen a, just an increase in getting these out with our clients because they are trying to figure out how do we, how do we get in front, especially with a remote, you know, culture for some of our clients, how do we get yep. in front of them in different ways? Yeah, one of the challenges, so, so Jeff mentioned that it can take 10 to 14 touches. I've seen reports of all the way up to 20, depending on yeah. what industry you're in, right? Yeah. So um, I wouldn't get too keyed in on specifically the number of touch points. It's going to vary. Uh, but what you do have to realize is that the average salesperson gives up after the second attempt. Yeah. So <laughs> after two calls, they don't get a response. They're like, see ya, on to the next. And then it's just repeat. And if you continually give up after two touch points and the data shows that it's taken, you know, 10 to 20, whatever that number is, you're never going to have success. Yeah, it's a lot. You're, a you're lot. never going to have success. So right. um, the challenge as a business owner, uh, you know, over the last three years, it really wasn't a challenge because orders were landing in our laps. Now that things are starting to slow down, we got to get back to selling again. But a majority of the people that are in these these roles have never seen a downturn. It's been yeah. what fourteen years, S something like yeah. that. Two thousand nine, two thousand ten. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so we need to get back to selling. And and how do you do that if you've never had to do that? Well, you need an integrated direct marketing and sales approach to help guide your team, guide your people, and give them something to actually talk about, so that they're not stopping at two. Right? They right. stop at two and because how many times are you going to call a prospect and say, hey, do you have any openings? No, we offer great service. We offer great people. We can help you solve your challenges. Call me back. Bye. All right. On the flip side, if you're answering all of those uh, issues, problems, questions, concerns that they have, over time, you're going to wear them down. And over time, you're going to be in the right place at the right time when their current provider screws up. And you're going you're gonna to earn that business. All right. So let's talk a little bit about leveling up awareness. So, so we talked about messaging. We talked about the A to sales funnel. We talked about how to incorporate that into a three by three network and um, integrated direct marketing. Jeff, let's get into some specifics here. What are you doing to help your clients set their sales teams up for success so that we don't stop after two? So, you know, here it's, it's about, so when we look at the ADA model, it is about awareness. So that's top of funnel. And it's really about just generating. And a lot of times it's talking about, um, you know, identifying that there is a problem, you know, and, and what you want to do is you want to be as targeted as possible. I've seen a lot of this, you know, uh, spray and pray, um, you know, where it's just, we're just going to throw something out. And, you know, the problem is, you know, when you do that and, you're, you're basically, when you talk to everyone, you're talking to nobody. So what we're always, you know, our recommendation is identify your top prospects, you know, look at those, you know, we call them elephant lists or whatever. And when I was working with the sales team inside of staffing and, you know, we would say, all right, identify, you know, 50 or hundred companies and let's really target, you know, those companies. Maybe there's commonalities where they're in one vertical or um, they're in one region, but let's, let's target those 50. Let's target those people. Let's put together an IDM campaign 
that almost, you know, kind of warms up those leads. They may be cold prospects and you want to just at least start getting those touch points out. Cause we know it's a lot. We'll say 10, 20, 30, whatever, but it's about getting that awareness piece out, awareness of the problem, and then creating a strategic follow-up plan and process. And that's what you want to make sure is that this is working within your current sales process. And then as you're doing that, you're expanding your three by three network. So when you're looking at developing your target list, you know, you want to identify everyone. I mean, we, when I was doing this at, on, on that side is we would look at, you know, like Brad said, finance, operations, we'd look at all the key stakeholders because they all had issues and they all had their different pain points and their metrics that they had to make sure that we're working. So what, because of that, if they're not hitting it, that's where you focus on those emotional drivers. And so you're just building a list based off of that. And that's a great way to just get that awareness piece out. All right. Um, Jeff, you talked about uh, spray and pray. Um, yes. now I, I assume that you didn't mean, you know, don't do these other things. But when you look at at that Dream 100, Dream 50 campaign, when you look at IDM, you're focused, you're, you're going after a very specific audience, but there's a whole collection of other companies out there too, that could be good prospects. How do you reach them? So I, mean, I think, you know, the, you know, the spray and pray is where you don't have a marketing plan, you know, hope is your marketing plan. I think this is if you've identified those 50 or 100 and you know you want to you know create some air cover around that you know these are the the tactics that i would look at you know so whether it's seo and making sure that your website is is keyword ready it's talking to that right industry or that right buyer you've got social media marketing you've got a posting plan ready to go you you know maybe you don't want to just rely on organic alone so you're looking at uh, paid advertising so keyword targeting maybe you want to do some competitive targeting online billboards or local, you know, if you're going to be hyper local, you may want to look at, you know, almost like an offline or even a geo, uh, geo targeted campaign. And then your traditional, you know, media. So again, you know, looking at PR efforts, maybe that's, you know, uh, traditional advertising. Um, and then recruitment marketing. And, and a lot of times, you know, you can use top talent to drive you know, yeah, hey, we've got this talent pool. It's fantastic. They're ready to work. What can we do there? So making sure that you're using some recruitment marketing um, programs to be able to bring in some top talent and bench strength to, to help market. And then the local branding is just making sure that, you know, you, you know, again, reviews, uh, testimonials, like you are able to really brand yourself as part of the community. I, we have so many just great success stories or case studies about companies staffing businesses that are using each of these. So uh, after the webinar, go over to our website, HaleyMarketing.com. Yeah. You can look at our work. You can look at case studies and look at some of these things in action. Like for instance, we're working with companies where they've identified competitors in the market or industry that they can outpace. And we can go in and take a look at those competitors, reverse engineer the content or the pages on their site that are driving the most traffic and most inbound leads, create better, higher ranking content, outrank them and steal that traffic. Great strategy. Pay-per-click, we can do some similar things. We can get you on the map with with paid ads so that you can drive more visibility both with prospects and with candidates there's so much that you can do here um so i did just encourage you to go look at some of those case studies and see what might apply to to your business now let's talk about leveling up their interest uh jeff what are you doing to get people through that funnel so you've you've created um visibility you've yep you know, you, we want to get them over the interest phase. How do we do it? So we've got to, you know, it, it, it's about getting them, you know, to make sure that they've identified, yeah, that there is a problem that, you know, there is, you know, they have a solution. And, and again, it's, it's still using that three by three network, you know, maybe you're segmenting um, to those different buyers and creating those emotional drivers. It is, you know, continuing with IDM campaigns. And maybe you could be more aggressive, you know, when you're identifying the, you know, the, the awareness side is, okay, you're aware that you're here as a company, that there's a problem and, you know, you are one of the players to solve it. Now it's about that making that connection and that's where the why is involved. So 
having that IDM campaign that, you know, when you're looking at different steps, you know, making sure that the why is in there. And again, going back to paid where you can do remarketing. Um, and so if they, in the awareness phase, if they've come to the site, you know what, make sure that you are remarketing them because they came to a specific page. Maybe it was about that industry or it was about uh, maybe a blog post or something like that, where you can tag them and then have them come back because, you know, again, it's multiple touch points or focus ads on, um, you know, initial interest. So, you know, there you have a pain point that you can really harp on that solves it. And you can talk about how you've solved it using marketing automation or using email marketing. I mean, anything automation is awesome. Um, I know that sometimes, you know, not all can, can, uh, can really reap the benefits of marketing automation, but it, this is a great way to do that. Um, and then using, you know, those sell sheets and, and print assets and not just a menu, you're not printing a menu out, but you're printing, you know, maybe a case study or maybe a, this is how we've helped multiple clients and using that in your marketing campaigns. And then anything around education and, and engagement, um, you know, asynchronous selling is, is awesome. I think, you know, one of those, you know, what asynchronous selling is, is, you know, right now you have to sell real time and you have to, you have to go through this whole awareness, interest, desire, action, all real time, you know, through multiple um, calls or zoom calls or whatever, but, you know, with asynchronous, you might be able to tell your, your entire story on a landing page with a video. And so you can almost get them down the funnel faster when they want to talk. Maybe they just, you know, had a long day and they, you, they get an email with a video that basically covers all of that. And what's nice about that is you're selling 24 seven and you put that on a landing page, a specific landing page for a lead magnet or any sort of, um, you know, content piece that, you know, drives the interest in your business. There's a lot here. We could probably yep. go for another hour about it. Yeah, you, don't you really do that. You you really could, but what's great about this is, you know, we mentioned earlier the average sales rep is giving up after two attempts. Well, yep. this gives them something to talk about, so extends that too. Now, are they going <clears> to <throat> themselves be able to hit that fifteen to twenty point, you know, touch point mark that really starts to see movement? Probably not. But when you mix in automation, email marketing, PPC, SEO, when you mix in all these different elements, it's amazing how quick you get to that 15 to 20 touch point where you begin to see some movement. And um, we just had a comment in chat from, from Kristen at the Headhunters. Um, shout out to Aaron from our team and Amelia from our team who are working on their PPC and SEO strategies. Uh, this is a great way to support and help your business dev departments at hitting that critical number of touch points and making their efforts that much more fruitful. All right. So a lot here. And I'm not saying that you have to do everything immediately, but begin to think about how you can mix these into your, your strategy. All right, so let's talk about leveling up their desire. How do we get people from interest to desire? Jeff covered a lot of these. Uh, we, we, again, need to build that three by three network and really focus on getting inside referrals. So what can we do to go one level above our target buyer? to get a referral down? What can we do to take a client that or a, a decision maker that we're working with in one department to get a referral over to another so that we can cross sell our existing clients? So think about that. Think about influencer marketing. Who already has the ear of these buyers? Who are the other vendors that are already selling to them? Do you have a relationship with them? Do you have other clients that you work on the same accounts with? That is a great opportunity for you to get inbound referrals. And if you can get an inbound referral from a vendor that they already trust and they already love, that's a great place to be. And it's a great starting point to... Uh, speed up that decision-making process. Look at marketing automation, and Jeff's going to get into that more. Look at landing pages with a singular purpose. If you're running any type of paid campaigns, if you're doing any type of email marketing, look at where you're taking people. Are you taking them just to the homepage, or are you taking them to a page that's easy to convert on? Look at low-hanging fruit, like top candidate marketing. Look at top job marketing. What can we do to get in front of those people? We've mentioned award 
awards, honors, recognitions already. Uh, build out your case studies and your testimonials. Uh, look at what data and information you can extract from your ATS to prove that your average time to fill is 10 days or less. That's a strong message right now. What can you do to create that desire and hopefully drive action? And then the last bullet here uh, really is don't be the hero, be the guide. What I mean by that is that you don't have to be the hero. You don't have to be the savior. Your goal is to make that buyer the hero. How can you make that buyer look amazing in their organization? That's your goal. So think about ways that you can support that and get them to see themselves as the hero, and then they'll want to work with you. So next, we're going to move on to the final part of our uh, ADA model here is action. Uh, we've been talking a lot internally about CRO. Jeff, you want to, at a very high level, explain CRO? Yeah, so CRO is, is you know, obviously you see it on here, it's conversion rate optimization. And what that is, is it primarily focuses on your website and, and how do you increase those people that visit your website to conversion, to convert, to leave their name, to, you know, download a piece of content you know, to continue down the page. And so a lot of websites, including ours, are built based off of this conversion rate optimization, which involves a lot of testing and, you know, making sure that um, everything is, uh, you know, everything is right. And, you know, there's all things about what's driving people to the site. Does the site, you know, display what it should display? And then also what's blocking people from not leaving their name or filling out a form or downloading a piece of content. So, this is an important piece because your website is is your living, breathing brochure. You know, and a lot of you know a lot of these staffing firms are using that as part of your sales process. So getting this right is important, and that's why we've been focusing a lot on it over the last year. I would say at least. Yeah, and as you'll see through this, it's all about driving that action, making it easy yep. and simple for someone to do business with you. If you can get people to a point where they can easily engage with you, you can increase conversions. Excellent. All right, so now, Jeff, let's transition. So that's the theory behind everything. Talk to us about very specific case studies <laughs> and what you're doing to help clients uh, drive people through that funnel and on to conversion. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's the fun part. So this, you know, primarily we're going to talk about automation. I know, you know, since Brad's my co-partner on this one, I, you know, I had to give him some love. So we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about some other things outside. But, we, you know, what I wanted to do is just talk about specific this, this sales process and what, how to nurture throughout the different parts of the sales process. One caveat before I start is you need to know your sales process. I know that sounds, you know, totally basic. But that is something as I work with clients around sales, like do, having a sales process and having a documented sales process is completely something new. Because again, you know, we said we haven't had to sell, we haven't had to nurture, we haven't had to follow up as much as we have now. So getting that sales process down is so key to be able to, to you know, accomplish these different, uh, different campaigns that I'm going to outline here. So starting at the very beginning, you know, sound of music or whatever, um, is prospecting. So the whole point of prospecting is to get the meeting. And, you know, the one thing that, that we want to do is, again, you're, you have a list of people and you've, you're getting a list, whether it's Zoom Info, Seamless, Apollo, Clearbit, whatever that is. And I'm seeing that a lot more now is that, that you know, staffing firms are using some of these services to get names. And what can we do to get names? And so instead of just getting the names and having somebody pound the phones, it's about, um, creating a welcome series. And so what we've seen from a best practice is put those names into an automation where, again, this is that awareness piece of nurture is just introduce the problem solution, get them into awareness, talk about desire. And I even break it into a high intensity to low intensity, you know, go with multiple emails, maybe over 30 days or 45 days. And we know that, you know, we don't know when they're going to, to, to buy or to contact you. So then transition into a low intensity, stay in front of them for another six months. That's a great way to, you know, allow the marketing to help give warm leads over to sales and stay in front of those, you know, maybe it's a dream 50 or dream 100. The other one is sales process fallout. That is one where I, I've had a lot of success where we've had about a 12 to 15% meeting rate. 
So a lot of what staffing firms are doing right now is following a sales process, you know, through a consultant or, you know, just their own sales process. And once they complete the process, they move on to a new person or a new group. Well, instead of just kind of like saying, okay, these guys are done, you know, put them into a handoff to an automation campaign. And once you have that human sales effort, throw them to an automation where you, you send an email a month for the next six to 12 months, make the message informative. And from there, again, you're staying in front, you're giving them information, you're educating. And, you know, you never know. Again, we've had 12 to 15% of those people that you never would have talked to to begin with to come back. Brad, you want to touch on the PPC targeting? Yeah, sure. But before we even do, everybody in the chat said that the long decision making, the long buying process has held things up. Um, we're seeing that across almost every industry. This yep. type of campaign makes complete sense. If you're not doing this, start doing it. It could be that you didn't lose the sale. They just haven't made the decision yet. And even if you did lose the sale, what happens if they brought in a new provider that they don't love? If you just right. forget about them and write them off, you're not going to win that business. Get one of these campaigns in place. And then look at PPC targeting. So ensure you're top of mind when the current provider fails. I think every single staffing company out there should be doing a remarketing or a retargeting campaign. You spent so much time, effort, and resources to get in front of the person the first time. Let's make sure that we follow them around the internet for the next six to 12 months because we know how long the decision-making process is. We know that at some point their current provider is going to screw up and we want to be right there when they do. All right. 100%. So that's, yeah, that, that's getting the meeting. Now, Jeff, how do we transition to get the order? So now we're in the sales funnel. So we got the meeting. We want to stay in front of them. What I recommend is a next step campaign. So when you look at the, at the phases, so maybe it's a meeting to maybe a second meeting, you know, where it's more about, a, you know, needs based and you want to learn more about their company, whatever that is, have these automations set up that move them to the next step. So if it's going from a meeting to a proposal or to a job rack or an order, or maybe it's an, maybe it's an agreement, you know, have these pieces in place and think about from a desire standpoint, what, what will motivate them to take that next step? Put those automations in because I know that, you know, salespeople have the greatest intentions in the world, but sometimes follow-up isn't as timely as it could be with automation. And so I would definitely say, have look at all those funnels and how are you moving them from each stage of, of your funnel in there? And then you want to touch on retargeting? Yeah. Again, once somebody hits your website the first time, we want to stay in front of them consistently. So if we can use these marketing efforts, these automations, these emails, these texts, recruitment marketing, if we can use our IDM campaigns to drive people over to learn more about our business, let's stay in front of them consistently. We need to be in the right place at the right time. They come to your website, they get tagged, ads for your business, for your brand, for your value, begin to follow them around the internet greatly increases the chance that they're going to convert. All right, Jeff, All right. getting feedback. Yep. So now you have a current client. We want to nurture current clients. And, and I'm not going to lie. I, I don't like the, the newsletter. Like, hey, we're going to do a newsletter. Like, I get it. We can do it. That's fine. You guys can do it. I just don't like the word newsletter. Um, so, you know, whatever. That's fine. But when you're a current client and you want to nurture it, you want feedback. How are you doing? So client MPS, some, I, I would imagine most are doing it, but I'm talking about consistent, you know, do it uh, quarterly or do it on demand. Maybe when they, you know, the placement hits, you know, it's part of the on assignment campaign where, you know, you send over to the hiring manager after a month of being on assignment, you know, how's everything been going? And then, you know, would you recommend us? And that's, you know, a great way. And, and honestly, even if it's a bad situation, you know about it. So you can, and I've seen where you can turn that bad situation into new orders, but you're getting feedback. Like how, how's your process working? How, you know, how is the delivery, the service delivery working? And so that one is just making sure that it's consistent. And then the second one is the hiring manager survey is really putting them into an on assignment campaign. You know, we talk about candidate on assignment, but this is all about the, the hiring manager and you can do a one-to-one -one, or maybe that hiring manager has multiple but what you want to do is, is ask how they're doing after one week. Maybe ask how they're doing after 30 days. And again, it's just getting data. And you want to be able to make that connection between maybe the, the hiring manager is thinking one way about 
what's going on and the, and the placement, the associate, whatever, is thinking another way about the company. And so data is, is really key here to, to be able to get feedback. And it helps in your uh, QBRs as well, your quarterly business reviews. So that's what I would do on current client. Inactive client, nurturing inactive clients, a check-in campaign. I, this has been huge. I've seen 60% open rates. I've seen 25, 28% conversion rates where you're just checking in with them. Maybe they've been inactive for, for six months, 12 months. Sometimes you triggered on the last activity or the, the last placement end date. But the whole point is that you never go too long without reaching out to them. And you can use this even for MSAs. I've seen that a lot right now is that clients that haven't executed MSA that you haven't talked to in a while. Use that as a nice check-in and say, hey, we're here. We, we, we know your company. We are, you know, we have an MSA. So we have speed. We can fill those jobs fast. Anything like that where you're asking for insights, ask for the order. That's key. Um, the second one on inactive clients is being strategic with your talent pool. I think, you know, marketing your skilled talent. I remember I was on the last lunch with Haley and we were talking about that. And it's, it's really key is matching the category of that job order that you have open and marketing your, your uh, skill sets, looking at those that match that and then marketing them in an, in an ongoing automation campaign and creating that nurture and basically saying, hey, you know what, this is, you'll be the first to, to see these people and would love to have you, you know, take a look at them and, and let us know if, if they could be, you know, a part of your company. That is creating a sense of urgency that they could be gone. And so I've seen that work really, really well right now. Yeah, the, these two I approaches think, are just money in the bank. If you're not doing yeah. this, um, either get a vendor that's going to help you with it, we'd be happy to help, or have somebody internally that owns this. Just do it consistently. Yeah, what's the closest to the revenue? And that's, you know, that that's the biggest thing is you want to be closest to the revenue. And these guys have had an order with you. It's about getting the next. And so they already know you. So yeah, definitely on the inactive client. And the last one is the former client. So you want to get a reintroduction. So a warm-up campaign. This one has worked out really well and depends on your rules. You know, so maybe you say a former client is one where we haven't had any activity in 18 months or whatever that is. But, you know, have a, have just, offer a coffee meeting or an adult beverage or, you know, breakfast and just talk about, Hey, it's been, it's been some time. I would just like to know more about what's going on in your company. You're not selling, you're not asking for the order. You're just reaching out. And then if you want to take that, you know, step further, have it come from the CEO, have it come from the business owner to just have a different voice, not just the salesperson or not just the VP of sales, have it come from the CEO that who wants to say, Hey, what could we do better? Would love your, you know, you're not working with us right now. And those I've seen 40 to 50% open rates. I've seen, you know, 18 to 20% meeting rates. And it's stuff that you're not going to do manually because honestly, it's hard to get to that. It's, it's all about, you know, working with the prospects. So these are great automation campaigns to just have for running in the background and just always having some activity in these different uh, buckets of your sales process. Yeah, it's going to help you get to that 20 touch point mark. All yep. right, so home stretch here. Uh, how do we level up our lead generation? Let's use all of the tools at our disposal. We can use SEO and answering questions, uh, clear conversion paths, creating more inbound links, pirating and stealing con uh, traffic from your competitors over to your site, PPC, targeted ads, remarketing, matched audiences. We can use content marketing to educate, position, and build authority. Of course, social media to stay relevant and top of mind, building out our reputations, making sure that we are a trusted provider, that we can get past procurement, we can get past risk. Um, throughout all of this reference awards, honors, affiliations, and then use all of this content in marketing automation, in IDM campaigns, in other places. Because staffing is not a one call close. What you're what you need to make sure that you surround your prospects with the right message and a consistent message. And that can come with direct touch points from your salespeople, that can come with automations, that can come with content that you're sharing, that can come with social, that can come in so many different formats. So use all of these different tools at your disposal and make sure that your message is about them and not about you. It's about their problems, not about what you do. 
With that, that brings us to the end. I'm going to open it up for questions. Use either the chat panel or the Q&A panel to ask questions. As those begin to come in, I'll answer those. But uh, we've got some more resources for you, too. So let's talk a little bit about how else you can level up. Uh, Hopefully, all of you have listened to a few episodes and are subscribed to our Secrets of Staffing Success podcast. We put out episodes weekly. Great insight about what's happening in the staffing industry, what's happening in marketing and sales in general, and how you can really differentiate your business and drive more visibility and inbound leads. We have staffing brain fuel. And, and Jeff, this is one of your babies. You've pulled together a lot of great information. So what are people going to find on, on HaleyMarketing.com forward slash brain fuel? Yeah. So we've, you know, we've really put together, you know, basically how to weather the storm of, of this, you know, recession, not recession, boom, not boom, but really taking, you know, specific content pieces and putting them on one resource center that has ebooks, guides, it has on-demand webinars and just putting that all together to help you figure out, you know, what's best for your staffing firm. Are you growing? Are you trying to, you know, just, you know, retain the clients that you have? So we've got a lot of great pieces there and it makes it a nice, you know, one-stop area in case, you know, people are, are you know, trying to go around to all the different content areas of our site. This is one stop for you. Yep. Great. And we do offer some great digital marketing bundles. You can find those at hillymarketing.com forward slash digital dash marketing dash bundles uh, so that you can have an out of the gate, amazing digital and inbound marketing strategy. And Jeff, talk to us about CRO site review. Yeah. So, um, you know, what we're doing right now is providing a free review of your website. And we talked about CRO, conversion rate optimization. So we'll do a 30 point review of your website. You just got to go to forward slash website review. Um, and what we'll do is we'll look at it from those best practices. And, and even, you know, like, you know, what we know with Google is best practices change. You know, the algorithm changes, you know, the design principles change. So we want to make sure that your site kind of has a roadmap of where it is right now and then where it could be with some simple or maybe uh, more intense um, upgrades or updates. So we're doing that free review right now. So, yeah, definitely go there. If you haven't already, and and uh, you know, we'll get you in the funnel and and start looking at it. All right, lots of good stuff. A um, few questions have come in. Um, last item here, our next webinar. It's an insights takeover. The hosts of our podcast, Brad Biley and Matt Lozar, are going to be joining our next lunch with Haley and talking through what's happening in the industry, what they're hearing, what they're seeing, uh, amazing insights. So be sure to sign up for that. You can reserve your seat at lunchwithhaley.com. Now, a uh, question just came in from Kristen. And this is one that I bet a lot of people are, are getting hit with. We still get a lot of inquiries from pr prospective clients who have never worked with agencies before and aren't familiar with how that works. Any thoughts on sales and marketing to this type of audience compared with those that are coming from a competitor? So part of the reason that uh, that you're seeing these inbound leads from people that have not worked with staffing companies in the past is because they can't hire on their own. Um, they oftentimes are smaller accounts, so it's probably not going to be a high volume account, but oftentimes they are higher margin accounts. Uh, and oftentimes are looking for talent at a higher level. So they can be very, very valuable. How do you get in front of those people? How do you work with those people? Um, Kristen, if you want to reach out offline, um, I've got a, a really interesting resource. So years and years and years ago, we created something called the Staffing Users Manual. So basically, it was a staffing for dummies type guide that walks you through all of the reasons why an organization should have contingent staffing, should have a staffing partner in place to help uh, companies overcome workforce and strategic challenges. So it walks through step-by-step step the value that staffing companies offer and how a staffing company's prices are, are um, developed. So it'll walk through things like markup. It'll walk through other items. So it's a great resource to um, 
really outline the value of staffing, why staffing uh, makes so much sense, and how it actually works. So it's it's a great piece of content for those new buyers to staffing. Now, the other thing that you can do to get in front of more of these buyers is to just consistently write content around the value of staffing. So earlier uh, in one of the slides, we walked through probably 10 or 15 different bullets about all of the reasons that staffing makes sense. Turn each and every one of those bullets into a great piece of content that can be put up on your website, that can be shared on social, that can be leveraged in IDM campaigns, that can be used in marketing automation. That is a great way to get that in front of in front of more people. So Christian, hope that answered your question. Um, and uh, if you want more information, just reach out offline. Happy to share more insight with you. Um, all right, great. Jeff, I know we're a few minutes over. Um, thank you so much for your time. I, I really appreciate a great insight today. Thank you all for tuning in. Be sure to sign up for uh, insights takeover. It's going to be a can't miss episode and, and Brad and Matt will share some amazing info there. Uh, Jeff, any closing words of wisdom? No, no, I think, uh, you know, I was going to say to Kristen's point, I, even if you're already, you know, doing this, take a look at those value bullet points. I mean, again, you could make, you could make some great email templates using those pieces. And I think, you know, whether you're working with clients who have never worked with staffing or just, you just need a refresher, use those bullets for your refresher. I think that's a great, great takeaway. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Thanks, Hope Brad. you found value in today's episode and reach out to us, us if there's anything we can do to help. Take care. Yep. Have a great day all.